we're going to do some spoilers in this. Let's let everybody know that this is a full spoiler Q&A for any book of mine that has been written. So uh, you have about an hour and 40 minutes or so to ply me with questions, and I'm going to raffle a lot of you. <laughs> but I'll try not to raffle too many of you. Um, if you're not familiar with raffle means, raffle means read and find out. Uh, I inherited the raffle from Robert Jordan. Uh, he came up with the term, uh, and the first night uh, that I went to Robert Jordan's house uh, after he'd passed away and his uh, wife had invited me in to work on the series, she handed me something. She handed me a bracelet that said Raffo. And she said, this was a, fa a fan gave him this, but I'm, re I'm metaphorically handing you the Raffo. You may now tell people to read and find out. Uh, and I have used it liberally ever since. Um, so I believe what we do is uh, do the QR code thing, right? Um, where you're going to scan the QR code. Am I correct on this? Where's my team? That's a yes from over there. Uh, and theoretically, this will all work, and you'll be told to come up and uh, ask me questions. So let's get going. Let's get the first few coming up, and I'll start answering questions uh, to the best of my ability, maybe. We'll see. So... Do we got this going on? Do I need to tell another story while we're waiting for it? That night um, that I got the raffo is the same night that I showed up at um, Harriet's house. And it had been a long flight, she knew. And she said to me, um, would you like some dinner? I have some bean soup in the fridge. We could warm up. And I, standing right in the inside to Robert Jordan's house, I said, no, I'd like the ending, please. Uh, and she laughed and she brought it to me because I knew she'd already told me Robert Jordan had written the epilogue to, uh, to A Memory of Light. Uh, and so she handed that to me and I sat in his chair, not knowing it was his chair, I just picked one, his writing chair, and I read the ending to The Wheel of Time. And that's, that's the, the first, I was the, uh, I was the first one to be able to read that who wasn't part of the company there. So, um, all right, let's start asking the questions. Go right ahead. Hello, Bart Thomas here, and my question is, have we met the Admiral of the Night Brigade or the family of said Admiral before? Um, so the Admiral of the Night Brigade is the protagonist of the unnamed Threnody novel. Ooh. You have not met her yet, um, okay. but, uh, but yeah, uh, the, I, I didn't say hero on purpose, I said protagonist, but uh, yes, when, when I write the Night Brigade novel, It'll probably just be called the Night Brigade. Uh, she is the protagonist. So you haven't met her yet. So, good question. And uh, yeah, continuity chains are very involved in that story if I ever get around to writing it. Next question. Hi, my name's Angela. Um, is Marais a sleepless? Marais is not a sleepless, despite the scar kind of sometimes being something I use to indicate if someone is a sleepless. It's an excellent question, uh, but I can go ahead and let you know Mraz is not a sleepless. Thank you. I'll stop thinking that. Yeah, good question. Good question. I'm glad somebody asked that because I, I realize now if I ever give a scar to somebody, they're like, oh, that's a, that, that means sleepless, but not always. Sometimes scars just mean you've been in a lot of fights. Uh, hey, my name is Jacob Rich. I was wondering, is Hoyt a Secretly a dragon? Uh, Hoyt is not secretly a dragon, though he did date one once. <laughs> I am Daniel Rhodes, and I'm asking, is Hoyt able to use soul stamps? Um, so, Hoyd is working on how to figure out how to use soul stamps. Uh, as you have seen so far, he has not figured out how to make that work. But he only just barely managed to, to get access to, um, to Selish magic systems. So he's working on it. Hi, I'm Robin. Um, is there a specific reason as to why Hoyt cannot skip, but Nomad can? Um, yes, there is a specific reason for that. Uh, I'll get into it someday. Uh, let's just say the skipping started because of a certain event. 
um, that you know probably I won't write a book to talk about, but uh, you will get an answer to that someday, I hope. So it's a raffo, but a raffo with a little bit of a promise. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Itai Hudas. Uh, I was wondering, what would happen if a uh, misboard ingested anti-Laracium or anti asium assuming it doesn't, they don't explode? Yeah, so if you are not highly invested yourself and you, uh, you get the anti, it's not going to be a fun time. You won't explode, but it will kill you almost assuredly. Uh, and so not a fun time, but not an explosively not a fun time. Just a regular old not a fun time. Maybe a little bit like pouring molten metal down your throat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello. Hello. My name, my name is Michael. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is about biology and genetics. We've, okay. seen, we've seen that um, magical systems are rely on either genetics, like in allomancy, or spiritual DNA. Yep. Uh, what will happen, or can we use technology like CRISPR to either weaponize or take someone's magical ability or give them magical ability? Um, so, uh, kind of. I mean, the in-world version of this is hemallergy, as you already know. Yeah. Um, there are methods that would do this, but straight genetics alone with CRISPR wouldn't do it. Um, the, you need the spiritual component for, for these to work almost assuredly. You might be able to use CRISPR. Yeah. No, I think basically it would be... I don't think there are many of them it would work on. Like, is it possible you could make someone into a chondra? That's maybe possible, right? But uh, I'm not even 100% sure on that. Can you use CRISPR with the sheen uh, viruses or bacteria from, from Silence Divine? Uh, probably not, but that's more likely. Uh, I'd have to think on that one. I'm going to say probably not for now, but we'll, me we'll minorly raffo that. Uh, good questions. Very, are you a geneticist? I'm a physicist. Oh, physicist. OK, yeah. Uh, my name is Tad. Um, the question is, is there any consideration or uh, favoritisms of, towards uh, composers or artists um, in terms of doing music and songs for your TV shows or movies? Boy, I would like to say yes, but the more I get involved with Hollywood, the more I'm learning they don't even listen to me on story stuff. Um, and so uh, I would like to say yes, but I can't promise anything. Uh, are you a composer? No. OK, just curious. Just like soundtracks. Yeah, yeah, just like soundtracks. Like, like the, I have some favorite composers, right? Like, I love Two Steps From Hell, um, right? Just that's the music like, that, uh, that I hear in my head when I'm writing a lot of scenes. Uh, and I'd be like, hey, you ever done a soundtrack? But I'm not, not going to be in control of that, most likely. I'm trying to get to a place where I would be. But I'll settle for them listening to me on narrative first. Um, uh, like I used to tell people, hey, we'll have an open casting call. I don't even think that will happen. Like I don't have control or authority over that. I think uh, when a Cosmere thing happens, most likely everyone big will be cast before there's even an announcement made. So uh, maybe in the future when I have a little bit more power, I can say, come on, let's start doing some open casting calls so that fans can have their, their shot at maybe being cast in one of these. But, I can't promise anything at all. Um, like, I can't even promise that they will listen to me on narrative. So, I'm doing my best. Hey, uh, my name is Brett, and I was wondering, with how Nomad was able to overcome his torment, would someone else be able to do something similar using soul stamps? Yeah, this is theoretically possible. Yeah, if you make, um, yeah. Yeah, I think you could do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Thank you. good question, excellent question. Mm -hmm. Stole stamps are one of the easiest ways to play with like spiritual DNA and, and spirit webs and stuff like that, so yeah. Hey, I'm Michael. So what's up with Canticle? You've got like the, the sunlight, it, it appears to be invested and then in, like mm -hmm. the plant's core is like trying to suck it up and eat it all. Like where does it go after it does that and like what's with that? Yeah, Canticle was built for a very specific uh, purpose by a very powerful being in the Cosmere. Um, that I will someday get to. You're gonna see some more stuff like this. Um, so ba what? Basically mega structures um, that, uh, that imitate planets or other sort of heavenly bodies. Right. 
And so it's not like some avatar of autonomy or something like that. It's, uh, it's not an avatar of anything. It was built for a specific purpose. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just uh, wait till I get to the grand apparatus. You're going to love that. What was that voice that talked about a future Cosmere planet? Hmm. Uh, hi, I'm Will. Hey. Uh, I was wondering if uh, who in the Cosmere could beat Tom in a fight back when he was in his prime. Back when in it, back when he was in his prime, who in the Cosmere can beat Tom in a fight? Uh, it depends if he uh, what level of abilities he has access to. If you're saying like access to full abilities and things like this, I don't know of anybody who could beat him in an actual one-on-one -on -one fight. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Don Locke. Hey. Um, now that Skyward Reckoners are over and it seems like Apocalypse, Apocalypse Guard is never going to be written, is there anything you can tell us about the connection between their multiverses? Yeah, so I've kind of been playing loose and free. So multiverses are annoying, right? Uh, when I wrote Steelheart, I realized, ah, multiverses are annoying. Uh, and the more I worked with Apocalypse Guard, the more I realized I didn't want to lean into this. And I'm glad I didn't because as, uh, as certain media properties have shown us, multiverses are just real hard to juggle and keep any sense of weight or value to the actions of the characters. Um, and so one of the reasons I didn't want to release Apocalypse Guard is I want to rethink all of that. Um, I do prefer things like I did in Frugal Wizard where I'm like, there are certain stable um, realities. There's not an infinite number of realities. There's an infinite number of possible realities, but some of them are solid, right? Some of them are real. And so you can find alternate versions of yourself, just not an infinite number of them. Um, and so that's one of the way, places I was going with that is, uh, and Apocalypse Guard did lean into this and started to progress that idea that I think one way you could do a multiverse, kind of have your cake and eat it too, is just be like, there's not four billion versions of you. There might be seven, right? Um, and things like that that are what we call stable and, uh, and, and, and quote unquote real, uh, which allows you to kind of play with that idea of multiple versions of yourself without everything going out the window in terms of buy, uh, you like, I mean, you know, you guys, you guys have seen Rick and Morty. It's like, hey, doesn't matter if we, if we die or if we mess up the planet. There's another one over there. We can only do this an infinite number of times. Um, but uh, so that was one of the things I was playing with there. Uh, and then, you know, multiverses are just like so overdone. Everything Everywhere All at Once did the best one. And we don't need to even try <laughs> anymore, um, right? Um, um, but that, that movie is proof that you can still have emotional connection and uh, power in a story that is about alternate versions of yourself. Um, and so it is possible. Um, so what's the connection? I do kind of have in my head that, uh, that each of these non-Cosmere properties kind of are on a continuum within this multiverse um, and are shades of one another. And Apocalypse Guard is going to kind of be jumping between them. But whether or not we'll get to that, um, I don't know, because I certainly don't want to have Skyward be ruined by the existence of multiverses, right? Like, uh, I like how Skyward turned out, the, the whole series I'm really proud of. Um, and so that's the, that's the question mark in the back of my head. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Jamie. Hey, Jamie. Hey, Brandon. Is there a limit to the amount of investiture that Nightblood can hold? Yes. Uh, yep, there, there is. OK. Good question. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Paige. Hey, um, Paige. Hey. Um, so we know that you've talked about how Hoyd would never want to go near Nightblood. If you were to be in proximity to Nightblood, would he be like force pushed away because of um, like he wouldn't be able to get close to him? No, or, like or he just wouldn't want to touch him. He would not want to touch him. Um, the thing about Nightblood is uh, Hoyt's one of the few that knows exactly how dangerous this thing is, right? Uh, and beyond that, like Hoyt is uh, depends on so much of uh, depends so much on the memories that he has in his breasts and things like that. And that would be one of the first things that would get sucked out 
by night blood. So if he were to touch night blood, he might lose centuries, right? Um, and this is a big deal to Hoyd. Uh, and so, yes, he could theoretically pick up night blood. It would just be a lot more disastrous uh, more quickly for him than it probably would be for others. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Annalisa. Who is the dragon that Hoy dated? Uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> Asking the important questions, Raffo. <laughs> Raffo, we've got a Raffo card for you, though. You may display it with pride. Here, oh, turn around. My sister's got one for you. When, uh, when I started raffle pe raffling people on the Wheel of Time, um, uh, I felt bad. It feels so, you know, people wait in line and then they get raffled. So I'm like, at least you want you to have a trophy for having been raffled. So your trophy is this card. Uh, and there are, there are two others I raffled. If you want to come find Becky and get your, uh, your, your card, you're more than welcome to do so. Hi, my name's Alex. Uh, I was wondering what the name of the sword is on all of our badges. Uh, so the sword on all of your badges we have not named yet. Um, though we have named the dragon. Do you want to hear the story of the dragon name? Yes, please. Yeah. So let me say that I have, uh, I, I have run this past my VPs and they have all rolled their eyes at me, which might mean they agree. <laughs> When I was playing d and in college, I came up with a character named Zabinus because I wanted to have the weirdest sounding fantasy name I could, and that's X-Z, Abinus, Zabinus. Um, and uh, there, the funny story here is uh, once I got married and Emily was pregnant with Joel, uh, people started asking me, oh, what names are you thinking? And I would see what they thought of me when I said, we're thinking Zabinus. It's got an XZ in it. <laughs> and it was hilarious to watch people go like that and not know if I was serious or not. <laughs> because I was a fantasy novelist, and I well indeed could name my kid Zabinus. Um, right? And let's just say that I know there are, there are celebrities who have outweirded me with ch children's names. Um, <laughs> But uh, I always thought that joke was hilarious. Uh, most people understood I was joking, but my cousin Jeremy, whom I love, you know, he takes me at face value, which is a dangerous thing to do. Uh, he, is, he is a supremely awesome person who likes to believe me when I tell him things. Um, and he looked at me and he said, oh, that's cool. You could call him Zabe for short. Um, and I'm like, oh, Jeremy. Uh, but, when we were designing this dragon that's kind of the, the mascot for, uh, for the convention, um, we thought, well, what about names? And everyone's throwing them out, and I said, I think we should name him Zabinus. <laughs> and as I said, they all rolled their eyes at me because they know the story, so I think that's an agreement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, hello, my name is Gideon. And hey. I was wondering if um, the Skybreaker's armor sprint are um, what spren they are. What spren they are? Well, do you have any guesses? Um, a storm spren? No, nope, not a storm spren. Good guess, good guess. Any other guesses? Um, gravitation spren. Uh, we're oh, going really? with gravitation spren for them. Yep. Oh, um, wow. So you should see some little hints of that in future books. Uh, and this isn't too much of a spoiler because we will be releasing all of these when the RPG comes out because you got to know how you get your armor when you play the RPG. So you'll be getting, you'll, you'll get, be getting all of these. But yeah, so there you are. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Hi, so my name's Chase Larson. Um, I was wondering if you were divesting yourself of all identity and then tapped and a massive amount of connection and investiture, would you be able to instantly have access to, say, the surges on Roshar without oaths? Um, so you want to get the oaths without, uh, without oaths, or you want to get the, the surges without oaths. Um, so what you're saying is you go, you, 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 you divest yourself of identity, you highly invest yourself, you're still going to need something that's going to tell that uh, investiture what to be and how to manifest in yourself. And so if it's the, the right intent, then maybe 
right? So um, within the investor, because you can have both identity and intent on investiture, and you can unkey it to one or the other or both. Um, and so that might be, but the thing is you're still gonna have to know. This is, this is a step toward getting what you want, uh, but there's still gotta be like something that tells it, you've, you're holding a massive amount of investiture. What do I do with this? Do I teleport you across the Cosmere to another planet? Do I do what do I do with it? And you're gonna have to have something to give structure to that investiture. So you've got, you're missing a step. Hey, how you doing? Hi, I'm Kenzie. Hey, Kenzie. Um, nice to meet you. Um, how many different types of AVR are there and what do they all do? Um, so, this is a RAFO because uh, I haven't even decided yet, right? Um, I, what I've decided is that there are dozens upon dozens of different kinds of AVR. Um, and so what that tells me is I don't want to nail down what all of them do because if I do, then I might need one for a story in the future. So this is kind of how the sausage is made sort of thing, is on a magic system like this, where I'm saving to maybe talk about it more in the future, I don't nail things down. When I need to write an entire series, and something I often will, nail everything down. Uh, but when there's as many AVR as there, as there potentially are, uh, I'm not gonna do that. So you may imagine uh, powers that, uh, that might come to exist in the future, uh, but I'm not going to tell you what they all are yet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm Thomas. Hey, Thomas. <laughs> so uh, my question is, the Aethers in Tress seem to take over their hosts kind of aggressively, probably without the host's permission. Yeah. Um, Whereas, as we see in The Lost Metal with Twin Soul, um, it's more willing. Yep. Uh, is this related and how to the corruption of Aethers on Lumar? Yeah, it is, it is related. So basically, you have the main Aether planet, which we just named, but I can't. So Kalyani named it for me. Uh, I'm relying on, well, Kalyani and Raul, I'm relying on them a lot uh, for this planet. Um, and uh, they actually just sent me a 5,000 word kind of world guide um, for it. What, are you guys here? Um, Kalyani and Raul? Um, um, they might be here. Uh, they're around uh, at the convention. Um, I've seen them. And so uh, they could tell us how to pronounce it. Uh, Dehartry might be how it is. Uh, but regardless, uh, on the main planet, so what uh, the idea here is that they're very formalized how you interact with the Aethers, um, but um, on some other planets, not just uh, Lumar, Aethers have gone that are not connected to kind of the main, um, the main set of them uh, on the main planet, and what's going on in Lumar is directly related to how that separation happened. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that's an answer is a long-winded yes. Uh, I'm Emily. Um, in Yumi, it talks about, uh, Hoyd hypothesizes about um, cultivation giving us nightmares to help us survive trauma. Uh, does cultivation have influence over people on all planets? Uh, or is that just like all shards? No, this is basically um, playing to his audience. Uh, and speaking in terms they would understand. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Hi, Brandon. I'm Shubham. Hey. How you doing? Uh, was Tanavast a dragon? Uh, was Tanavast a dragon? Tanavast was not, but that's an excellent question. Uh, there, there are there, there are some other dragons out there. So uh, so you yeah. If you keep asking, you might find, get some yeses. This is a no. All right. Thank you. Uh huh. Hi, Brandon. My hey. name is Alexis. Hey, Alexis. Have I given you a pin yet for coming in costume? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, good. Um, my question is, which type of slug is your favorite and why? Uh, so my favorite slug is Doom Slug uh, because I came up with her first, and um, I really like writing Doom Slug. There's some fun stuff in Defiant. Um, in fact, one of my favorite lines in the whole series 
is, uh, involves Doomslug in this book. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so Doomslug's my favorite. Boomslug, invented by my son Dallin. Boomslug is his favorite, because I was working on the series and he knew about Doomslug. He's like, you should have a Boomslug. And he should wear sunglasses. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Well, we have mind blades. There's going to be a slug for mind blades. He's like, and he has to explode. And I'm like, explode? That's not. He's like, nope, Dad's got to explode. His name's Boom Slug. So, Boom Slug went into the books and explodes. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Tom. Hey, how you doing? Um, is there a reason that the Night Brigade is following Nomad and can seem to follow him, but can't seem to follow Hoyd? Yes. It's good to know. <laughs> uh, so, answer to that is um, they have a way of tracking who, like, once they find someone, they can find the chain to the next person. Okay. So they were able to go from Hoyd through the chain okay. to get to Nomad, and they're trying to find where it went after that. If okay. that does that make sense? That makes so. sense, yes. <laughs> Hi, Brandon. Hey, I'm how Rat. you doing? Good. Um, so if Hoyt took Larazium in yeah. Mistborn Secret History, yes. does that mean his hemallergic spikes are furochemical? Uh, his hemallergic, what hemallergic spikes? I was in Hoyt and his magic systems and they said that he had hemallergic spikes. Mm, he does have, he does hold some. They may not be in him. Oh. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, so Hoyt has hemallergic spikes carried with him because the people who asked me if Hoyt has some really spikes didn't say which one. He does not necessarily have them spiking him. Okay. He actually has like a little, uh, little bandolier type thing. Like my son has this thing you unroll that has pencils in it, colored pencils. Hoyt's got one of those with a bunch of spikes. Uh, he was going to use them in one of the books, but it turned out to not be necessary, so I didn't put it in. Um, so, yeah. Hey, my name's Adam. Hey. Um, I was wondering, what's the first shard you thought of, and what gave you the idea for it? Uh, first shard I thought of, and what gave me the idea for it. So the first shard shows up in Aether of Night, um, the unpublished novel. Um, and the idea behind that, um, boy, it's been since 1999. Uh, it, that, this is a deep cut. I can't even remember why I came up uh, with that shard, and I can't even remember now which intent I gave it. Uh, I've got it in my notes somewhere, but that's where the kind of the origins of the shards and things like that was in Aether of Night. Um, and so, yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Boy, sorry, the stuff back from the, uh, from the 90s is a little hard these days for me to put together because I was writing these novels without knowing that I was going to do the Cosmere, right? Um, the first novel I wrote knowing I was going to do the Cosmere is Mistborn. And so that was really conscious and deliberate, and it's a lot easier for me to tell you, starting with Mistborn 1, where, why I made the choices I did. Um, in the 90s, I was a new author. I was writing by instinct, instinct more than design in a lot of these cases and what felt right. And I was learning my process and learning how to formalize it, which was why later on I can, t I can answer these questions way easier than I can for those earlier days when I wrote Dragonsteel and White Sand and even the first draft of Elantris. Um, you know, I'm just like, hey, this seems like a cool story. I'll write this. Uh, so, yeah. Hi, my name's Ali. Hey. So my question's related to the role of silver in the Cosmere. Yes. Does silver break connection or bonds like Luhel or Nuhel? Uh, right. I, and, yeah, go ahead. And then I guess my follow-up would be if silver does have this effect, does it get used in the creation of unkeyed metal mines? Uh, so these are good questions. So silver, as I have it right now, is not capable of that. What silver's doing is it's disrupting. It's more like a, um, 
interference. Like the way I have silver, like you know how in white sand people can have these columns of sand that, that uh, you know, like if you swipe silver through that, they would fall, but then they would be able to do it again. Does that make sense? Like it's like this, this little nullification uh, for a short time. It's very dangerous to like, uh, things like shades and stuff like that, but it's more disruptive, right? Like if you hit a spren with this, it would be like hitting it with a shard blade. They're gonna come back together. They're not dead. They're gonna reform eventually um, and probably won't take that uh, take too long. And so it's not severing connections. You're gonna need anti-investiture um, in order to, to do like really destructive stuff, but you can disrupt with some silver. Thank you. It's specifically bad for shades for reasons maybe I'll get into someday. Yeah, good question. Um, Hi. Is, hello. Um, my name's Rosalyn Cherry, and I was wondering, can you have like multiple spren? Can you have multiple once? spren at once? Uh, this is theoretically possible uh, to have multiple spren. They would both have to agree. Uh, which might be difficult to get them to do. But it is possible. Good question. Excellent. Well done. Thank you. Someone may have done that already. <laughs> it's, it's pretty obvious to you if you've read, uh, you, you should be able to pick out who that is by reading uh, from, uh, from Rhythm of War. Yeah. Hi. Uh, it's not two different orders. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, I'm Patrick. Uh, hey. I'm wondering, following the Catasandra, how did um, capitalism develop in the Ellendale Basin? How did it develop? Um, so you were, yeah. So I find that in history, large disasters cause a great outpouring of fellowship followed by a great outpouring of uh, mercantilism, shall we say. Uh, I think COVID's a pretty good example of this. Uh, and so I would say that following the Catacendra, um, the fact that uh, everyone pulled together for a little time worked, but then there was a whole lot of opportunity and a whole lot of people looking to seize that opportunity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, Brandon. My name is Victor. Uh, hey. On chapter 36 of The Sunlit Man, when the Cinder King is talking with Nomad, uh -huh. talks about power, talks about how someone gets power, and he quotes, do men from your world, and he says, men, not man, men from your world really become gods? Is this related to the search binding powers that Knight's Radiance can develop, or is this because of some people may have ascended? since the events that no, after Nomad led Roshar? This is a brilliant question, and I'm gonna have to raffo it because it might be spoilerific. I'll treasure this forever. Smartly asked, my friend, smartly asked. Um, hey, have I given you a pin for coming in costume yet? You have not, no. Well, would you like one? <laughs> my assistant one. is sitting right there and can get one for you. <laughs> okay. Um, so we've seen Renarin do some pretty fantastical things in both Oathbringer and in Rhythm of War. Yes. And my question was, are Truth Watchers able to use aspects of the progression and light weaving surge to sort of have someone or something become a different version of itself? They can't make that happen, but they can certainly invite. Thank you. Good question. Hi, Brandon. Hey. Uh, my name's Marta Cleverly, and I was wondering if you had any embarrassing stories that you haven't told anyone that you'd like to impart upon us today. Oh, boy. All right. Um, I can't, I don't know if I've told, did, can it be embarrassing for my kids? They're not here. Please. <laughs> okay. All right. By the way, do you have a pin? You came in costume. We'll get I you a not. pin. Perfect. Um, all right. So let's see. A good embarrassing uh, thing that will be embarrassing to my children, but not my wife. Um, so, uh, tell me if I've told this story. We're sitting in church, 
and I, my middle son, my best stories are all about him. Um, for whatever reason, he, uh, he is, we look over, and it's like the quiet part of church. Uh, it's sacrament or communion, or basically everyone's sitting there quiet. And he is going at it in his nose, digging for gold. He's got it way up in there. And my wife and I look at him, and my wife is horrified as he pulls out the largest booger you've seen, right? Emily, being an experienced and wise parent by this point, has wet wipes handy. And it's like one fluid motion, like drawing a sword for her to unsheath the wet wipe and go wham and grab it right as he's going for his mouth, right? <laughs> she pulls it off and, you know, and then he, in his outside voice, not his inside voice, says, hey, give me back my booger. <laughs> I wanted that. <laughs> yep. So. Thank you. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, my name's Ethan, and mm -hmm. I was wondering if there was, like, in Yumi, an in-world reason why the paintbrushes the painters use are so long, or if it's just, like, a stylistic choice. It's a stylistic choice. Um, so there's some things in, um, in lore for painting about, uh, this goes with chopsticks, too. The length of your brush, the length of your chopsticks, in part, it shows how wise you are. It's part of actual Korean mythology and lore. Um, and so the long brush... Uh, a very long brush is seen as like a mark of elegance um, and even like morality in some cases. The, the chopsticks are a sign of morality more. But like you will see these paintings, for instance, of, um, of Buddha and like he's got chopsticks that are just like, like that. Uh, and I, I asked once, they're like, oh yeah, long chopsticks, sign of wisdom. Uh, being able to manipulate. Then the, the long flowing uh, brushes, um, they actually do use them. You can see them. They're not used very often, but uh, they just, they look really cool. And I, I think they're awesome. So that's where I went. Cool, mm -hmm. thanks. So symbolizing wisdom of which Nicaro has very little, but <laughs> he's learning, he's getting better. Hi, Brendan, my name is Tegan. Hey. I was wondering, can someone who's not native to Nalthus use other forms of investiture to awaken objects? Uh, yeah. So once again, you're getting into this idea of how do you tell the investiture what to do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so what you're asking for is possible. It's absolutely possible. Okay. Um, but like um, uh, things becoming awakened like they are on Nalthus is not a natural result Right? Like we have a few natural results. Like if you take a bunch of investiture and in, some things will happen to you that are, that are going to be shared across the Cosmere and things like that. And if you put investiture into something, like investiture getting separated off and becoming self aware, that is natural. That process takes a long time. Right? And so mm -hmm. awakening itself is a formalized way of doing this. And you're going to have to have a way to tell the investiture basically what you're trying to do with it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Jackie. Hey. And I was, I guess, wondering, I heard of interesting theory at the con, is Lyft entirely human? Um, that's a wonderful question. Um, I would say yes, but the modifications that were made to her make her kind of a unique version of a human. If Hoyt is still human, Lyft is still human, um, if that makes sense. And you shouldn't be reading too much into that in Hoyt. It's just that he's had so many things happen to him over the years and so many changes to his spirit web and things like that. I would say, yes, he is still human. And Lyft still is as well. But there have been modifications made. Hello, I'm Doug. Hey, Doug. Uh, also known as Isaac. Hi, Isaac, Doug. And uh, my question is, so in You Mean the Nightmare Painter, design mentions being a shark blade. So my question is, what oaths have Hoyd sworn? What oaths have Hoyd sworn? So Hoyd has sworn, uh, well, we'll wrap out how many of them. OK. But, um, but he is doing the light weaver thing, which was kind of hard for him, honestly, to, to admit he had to admit some truths. He didn't want to. 
All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep, you can get a raffle card. Hey, Hi, how Brandon. you doing? Uh, this is Nisarg. Um, yeah, my hey. I saw you yesterday. Yes, mm -hmm. um, thank you. Uh, my question is, what is the grand apparatus? Uh, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> ah, there you are, doing Aiden Alcium's work. Um, <laughs> The grand apparatus is reference to a planet in the Cosmos you haven't seen yet that is completely um, non, it's, a, it's very obviously uh, constructed uh, for a certain purpose. Um, so, um, yeah, there we go. We'll, we'll just say that. That's a, you can get a raffle card, I'll give you one. I'm mostly raffling that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alex. By the way, that's, my, that's not my canon name for it. It probably will be, but I, I haven't Googled that to make sure someone else hasn't used it and things like that. I might do that and be like, oh no, did you not know that Microsoft has a thing called the Grand Apparatus? That happened to me once, right? Oh, I've got Silverlight. They're like, oh, what, like the Microsoft program? I'm like, ah, yes, I guess. So, anyway. Sorry, I'm still reeling from that. Mm -hmm. Grand Apparatus and all. Um, so, when stealing attributes with a spike, do oaths, vows, and other binding agreements come with that spike? Um, so, some of them would and some of them wouldn't. Okay. Uh, Basically. Follow-up. Yeah. Can mm -hmm. shards be spiked? Can shards be spiked? Like a shard of Aiden Uh Yeah, or yeah. honor or any uh, of that. So, this is just not going to work really well. Um, a shard, it, it's, it's a little like saying, like... Um, can I give a, a piercing to a whale? Like, okay. like, okay, but it's just, it's, it's not going to do anything, and it's going to fall off, and it's going to be like, right, like, uh, and the moment they notice it, it becomes irrelevant and things. So it's like one of those, the, the, the most technical of yeses, but it's just basically worthless okay. uh, to try it, if that makes sense. Cool. Um, because, you know, again, you're going to have to find like a physical form of a shard to do that. So it's like, what are you doing? Uh, like, is it some, uh, is it some like avatar that they've made that'll just evaporate when they're done with it, right? Like, what does it even mean to spike a shard? Um, like, you know, are you talking about somehow getting access to their vessel, which has been completely transformed into investiture at this point? So how do you spike that, right? Like, there's all sorts of, like, of, of asterisks to this answer. It's a, but, but with a technical yes, I'm sure you could find a way to do it. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Mm-hmm. I'm too short for this. Um, <laughs> uh, so my question has to do with, um, so when somebody takes up a shard, do they inherently get knowledge when they get that shard? Um, so for example, does Taravangian know about hemallurgy now, just intrinsically because he took up with the shard, or was that yeah. really just Ruin's thing? So excellent question. Taking up a shard is going to impart a large amount of knowledge more than even a shard can process immediately, and it will take some time. And it's going to give you the ability to access a lot of other kinds of knowledge, right? Like, um, uh, shards aren't omnipresent, but they kind of are, right? Which, like, they are, um, they are able to do many things at once, they are able to focus on places and be aware of that location in a lot of instances. Um, they are, but at the same time, they are limited in their ability to like, they don't know everything. They might be able to get access to most things, but it takes like conscious, like I need to know this, I need to find it out. I mean, it happens that it's written in a book that I can just, it's on this other planet and absorb and immediately know, well, okay. Uh, assuming it's not written in a way that you can't access, uh, which certain formats make it hard to do. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, uh, and so, uh, Tara Vangian, if he, if he cared to think about like what hemallurgy is, it's well enough known that he could be like, I wonder if there's a way to steal, oh, it's this, this is how it works on this planet, right? Like, that would be an almost instantaneous thing for him to be able to learn. Okay. Um, if he wanted to, but does he hold it in his head right now? Uh, that's remains to be seen. Interesting. 
Mm-hmm. And really quick, does Spence's mom have a name? Because I'm dressed as her. Oh, name. yeah. Spence's mom does have a name. <laughs> I can uh, find it. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll canonize that for you. It's in my notes. I'll make sure uh, that I canonize <laughs> that for you. We'll, 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 we'll send out a tweet, okay? Thank you. I want, I'm going to double check with Karen before I do it, though. Yeah. Yeah, this is the problem with writing about kids. We all just call our mom's mom and our grandma's grandma. And so it's kind of it's one of those things. My mom's name, though, by the way, is Goober. <laughs> I mean, she might go by Barbara once in a while, but we all know it's Goober. You guys have heard this story, right? I grew up calling my mom Goober. My dad's nickname for her was Goober. And uh, as I understand, I hope I'm not getting this wrong, uh, uh, but she resisted it at first, but then like her whole family, like her sisters started calling her Goober. And everybody started calling her Goober. And so when I was like a teenager, she even had like a thing on her desk that said the Goober. But my dad had made it for her. And my dad's spelling is uh, kind of like mine. And so it actually said the Gobber. <laughs> this is true, because he made it for her. But she, her desk like, you know, at work was like, here's the Goober. Um, and so, yeah. So anyway, my mom's name is Goober. Um, I'm not, yeah, anyway. She might sign your books as the goober if you ask her really nicely. Don't bother her too much, though. Hey, how you doing? Hey. My name is Josh. You met me yesterday. Hey. Yeah, I came as Wax. So my question is about Reckoners. Are there any heroes, villains, or other characters you came up with that ended up not making the final draft of the books? Yeah, there were a bunch of Ooh. powers and things like that and names and things, but it's now been long enough that I'd have to go consult my notes. Um, most of them that I came up with, I abandoned for one of a couple of reasons. Number one, I went and did my research, and there's like a Marvel or DC character that just de- does that exact thing in that exact way, right? Um, that didn't stop me completely because they've done everything. Uh, but, you know, uh, so with some of the side characters in particular, I like to try to throw out something that seemed a little um, odd. Number two, there just wasn't a place for it, right? Um, like I'm writing the book and I just, I didn't need, uh, another one to use here. Um, those are the main two, right? It's like, the, you do this a lot in books. Um, and so I'd have to go look at my notes. I don't have them off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. You can have a raffle card if you want one. Cause it's, it's more of a Brandon forgot and find out. Um, um, Becky will be back in a second. You can have one. Mm-hmm. Hey, I'm Kelly. Uh, mm-hmm. In a battle versus a fer- ferrochemist and a windrunner, if the ferrochemist were lashed directly upward, would increasing his weight cancel that lashing out? Um, all right. So what? You're getting into the weird stuff. Uh, <laughs> good for you. Um, all right. The weird stuff. So the way that um, lashings work are by rewriting your body's interaction with gravity, right? Mm-hmm. That's very weird. It's very, very weird. And um, so, but the way that ferrochemy works, um, it is kind of the same way. It's like, um, um, I play loose and free with this one. This is the one that drives Arcanus mad. Uh, it is actually like changing. And so would it, what would it do? What would it do? <laughs> So part of me wants to say you would fall upward faster, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But that's not how gravity works. So that wouldn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, But would it counteract the lashing? Um, I think that the lashing would incorporate it and nothing would change, I think is what's going to happen. That is my best guess. But your lashing then probably runs out faster. Okay. Right, that's, uh, that's my off-the-cuff answer. I'd have to really look at the, the mechanics of that. Uh, but you can take that um, for now. Uh, and I'll, I'll have to consult with the arcanist and make sure that I'm not, uh, I'm not going, going crazy on you here. Yeah, good question. Mm-hmm. These are the sort of questions that stress test the magic system in kind of really good ways. Uh, the arcanists love these ones because then they come and throw them at me and say, all right, let's get a real answer here, Brandon. 
And I'm Joseph, and my question is, is there a relationship between the cinder hearts and what happened to Amram? And if so, what is it? Yes, there is a relationship. It's just kind of built on some basic fundamental uh, Cosmere principles um, uh, with some of like, so this power feeding um, a little bit on your, even your own sense of identity and connection and things like this um, as the kind of power consumes it and kind of starts to turn you into a spren a little bit is what's happening there, right? Uh, and, and kind of like drawing it in. So they're very similar mechanisms. It's not that they're related magically, like in a, like a, a lineage of magic sort of way, but on the fu same fundamental principle. Um, and this is what lets, uh, lets the unmade kind of just take over the person, slowly consume them, uh, and then move on. Yeah. Not slowly, fat, quickly. It goes pretty fast, depending on the, yeah. I'm Stephanie. Hey. Um, okay, I have a two-part question. When the Heralds abandoned the Oath Pact, why did they believe they needed to leave their honor blades behind as they disbanded? Did they know what would happen to their blades after they left them? All right, so there's a couple things going on here. Um, if you've read Way of Kings Prime, um, there is built originally into the honor blades the ability to find the other honor blades by using them. Um, this has not been canonized into, um, into the Cosmere as it exists yet, but it is still a power that's in the back of my hand, that, mind that is most likely something you can access with the Honor Blades, let you find the others. This is kind of pulling back to the old Fred Saberhagen day of the Swords books, which were part of the inspiration for these. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so one reason they would leave them behind, the lesser reason is they're supposed to go split up and they don't want to see each other. Uh, they want to leave them behind because it's like uh, the others might be able to find me, right? Uh, and we're supposed to, we're just, we're going our separate ways, we're done. Um, but the greater reason and the canon reason uh, that you can cite is that idea of I am, I am walking away from being a herald. This was the gift I was given and a representation of that gift I was given that represents me standing up for humankind, and I am no longer willing to do that, so I have to give this thing up, right? And they all knew it, right? They didn't have to be told it because they knew what they were doing meant that they didn't deserve those anymore in, in a more, not in a magical sense, but in a sort of philosophical and moral sense. So there you, you go. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hey. Uh, I'm Ben. Uh, my question is about uh, Vin's earring. Yes. That uh, we see later on in the in the books that uh, hemorrhagic spikes lose their lose their charge fairly rapidly, but Vin leaves her earring sort of in a box for most yeah. of her life. So how does it retain enough charge to still have enough of an effect for her to you know be able yeah. to achieve what so she needs to do? So I have this on a logarithmic scale. So basically, the, at the beginning, you lose some power pretty quick, and then it evens out. Um, and my, my answer there is just there was enough left, and it could have at that point gone for decades without getting to the point that it's a hemallergic spike in name only. Um, the reason they want to keep the, they want to maintain as much power in those as they can. Um, which is why they talk about this thing. Like the first day you leave that spike um, without, without a host or without taking certain precautions, you lose the most power that you're ever going to lose, right? And so those who are aware of this try very hard not to let that happen. But once it does happen, you end up with something like, uh, like Vin's earring that still has a hemolytic charge, a, a, a significant one, uh, enough of one to have a change on the person wearing it. Um, you know, if we didn't do this, then like Coloss spikes, right, would just event, would be, would be meaningless very quickly um, and things like that. So anyway, I, I built it into this as well, great smell, right? It's just, you know, it's one of those things. It's one of those like steep drop off and then that thing. So, so. by the end, she's not like twice as uh, strong, just like 1.1. 1. 1, yeah, or, okay. yeah, yeah, you, you got it, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Jack. How you doing? Um, I'm doing good. How are you? I'm just fine. All right. Um, I have a mechanics question. Okay. So, if a leecher who also can burn Duralumin touched a normal person, 
and burn both metals at the same time. How bad is that going to be for you? Oh boy. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. So, Leecher burns Dura, Dura Lumen. Um, let me ask you this. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> I think that there is a very short term, like, where's my soul effect that may or may not be permanent. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're probably. I'm going to raffle this for, for now because okay. I'm planning to do some of this in the future. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'll raffle it for now. Uh, I think you're theorizing in the right direction. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Duralumin lets some weird things happen, uh, as you have seen in the books. So, yeah. Hi, Hi. I'm Mara. Um, why or how are the Heralds the only one we see so far that are affected by magical maladies due to either the high investiture or long life situation? Um, I would argue the fused are having the same situation, so they're not the only ones. Um, and so the, the why and how has, uh, the, there's a whole host of things going on here. Uh, and it's not like, like a lot of like physical and mental ailments, it's not one thing or the other. Um, but it is a compound of the things. Uh, one is um, being going so long without certain protections that you kind of need to take. The, the human being's soul might be a, a mortal, depending on your argument of the Cosmere. That's really up to you. But they certainly aren't meant for thousands of years of existence in the same way that our bodies aren't, right? Um, and so there's some of that. There's some of the things they've been through, like legit trauma. This is not all simply a magical uh, ailment. This is, I mean, the, you've got people with PTSD, layers of PTSD on top of layers of PTSD uh, for thousands of years, um, bearing things that no human being without their level of investiture would even be able to bear, right? Uh, you've got that manifestation. You've got their own sense of guilt, right? Uh, and these things are all just kind of uh, overlapping together uh, with the fact that they've been alive for so, so very long. And a lot of the people that you've seen otherwise, uh, like, have not been alive nearly, like, it's orders of magnitude more for the Heralds. Uh, the only people you've seen that are that old um, are, you know, some of the dragons, Hoyd, and you know vessels of various shards and you're basically at that group and this is a group who knows what they're doing either they were built like the dragons they like this is part of their innate nature that they are functionally immortal or you are getting the shards which just doesn't affect right uh, or you're getting people that are 300 years old which is a very different thing Cosmere wise than having lived for you know thousands and thousands of years part of it being tortured Mm -hmm. Hello, I am Todd. Hey, Todd. I am Brandon. All right. Uh, I have a two-parter, and we're kind of getting into the weeds. Okay. Okay. So I think we've been there, but yeah. <laughs> you've spoken before about if the shattering took place at a different time or different circumstances. Yes. The shards would have been different. They could have been. Could have been. Yes. Does that mean... Someone 100 percent the Cosmere and gets all 16, does that make them, or does that produce Adenalsium, or would that be different? That is a Rafo. An excellent question, <laughs> but uh, that is a Rafo. Do you have a second question? On a smaller scale, uh -huh. say a shard is splintered beyond recognition. Would some rather industrious people with something perhaps like a Dawn shard be able to change that shard? Yes, this is theoretically possible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hi, I'm Chris. Hey. Um, this is m less theory and more of kind of like your words of how the sausage is made. Yeah, so, okay, great. I you, like those questions. <laughs> your portrayal of atheism, addiction, depression, dissociative identity disorder, and more is pretty incredible. And I'd, I'd love to have you tell us more about the work that you put in to portray these topics that could be controversial, delicate, pretty heavy, and like what that means to you as an author. Yeah, um, so as an author, 
Um, I consider it my duty and my responsibility to try and represent the world as accurately as a depiction of it can. Plato would tell you it's impossible to do, he's right, but we can do better or worse at such depictions, right? Uh, and so as an author, like uh, I've said many times before, when I see myself or something I believe represented in fiction, all I want is it to be represented accurately, right? Um, and I, as a longtime reader and lover of stories and a big believer in the fact that one of the purposes of the stories is to kind of connect people um, and uh, unite them, uh, maybe at least connect them, let us see through each other's eyes that it is uh, my responsibility to try to depict the world accurately, specifically as people see, want to be seen, right? When I'm seeing people see them the way they want to be seen, uh, as authentic, uh, if that makes sense. Um, and this is just a big important part of why stories, why I read stories, why I write stories. Uh, it doesn't say that someone else's philosophy can't be different and uh, in so doing, they could create great stories. Yes, they could, but that is my philosophy. Um, and so that puts me in a position where if I am going to write stories and I am going to try to explore the world and understand the world better through uh, looking through the eyes of different people, then I'm gonna, I better do a good job of it um, because if I don't, I will do harm instead of good, right? And, you know, I've got to do no harm sort of thing. Like, my job is to make the world a better place, not a worse one. Um, and um, it, gets, it gets challenging, though, uh, um, because newer writers, um, this is very hard to do. And it's kind of um, comes back to a, a story I've told before, if you don't mind a little bit of story time. Uh, and I, you know, this might be apocryphal, meaning I might have heard this told to me, I can't remember what hand, but there's, there's supposedly a famous uh, parody case uh, that happened where someone wrote a parody of another work, got sued for it because it actually wasn't funny. So um, they're like, they went to court and they're like, yeah, but it's not funny. It doesn't count as a parody if it's not funny. And the judge in this story, whether I know it's real or not, but it always meant something he said, we can't base the skill of the author as the dividing line of whether something is fair use or not, right? Someone who is bad and learning needs to have the same protections that someone who is good at it has. The law can't be a, a judge of whether something is effective. It needs to be a judge of what was being attempted. Uh, and so in this regard, like I think there is a burden on me as a famous author with a large reach that isn't on a new author who is just trying. So if, if, if this panics some of you, understand, you should do your best, but honestly, your early stories that you, tell, that you write, probably you're not gonna do a very good job, right? In my early ones, I didn't. Uh, you can look at how I've grown in my depictions of, uh, of autism, right? Um, and so do be aware of that. Do be aware, even if you are um, a, become a skilled writer, you're still gonna make mistakes. Own those mistakes and do better. Um, but the answer to how I do it is I rely on a lot of help. Um, being an author is in some ways, I mean, it's awesome, but it's also one of the most challenging things we have is that we need to be an expert in everything, right? Uh, if you're going to write an epic fantasy novel, the daunting part about that is you need to know economics, geography, history, philosophy, um, psychology. Uh, you need to know the history of warfare and how it plays out. You need to know, if you're writing a uh, hard fantasy, you need to know physics and chemistry, and you need to be able to bring all this together using folklore, and that's all aside from being able to actually write a story, which is the hardest part, right? And that is super daunting. That is super terrifying when you think about it, but the nice thing is, you don't have to be good at it all at first, and your first draft does not have to be good at it all. Um, I'm, like, I rely a lot on primary sources and beta readers who really know their stuff. Just ask 
Uh, one of my beta readers, the pilot, is here, and he, uh, he can tell you how poorly I did G-forces and Skyward first draft, where something I thought I actually knew. I thought I'd gotten myself there, and I was just wrong, right? Uh, you, can, uh, you can ask, um, though I will not out who it is, I do have DID uh, beta readers, people with, uh, with DID, who have been really helpful in getting some of that right. Uh, and I made some pretty embarrassing mistakes in rough drafts. Fortunately, there are people who are willing to help me get it right and not be too bad at me for getting it wrong uh, first off. Uh, so it's a combination of things. I believe it's a moral imperative of my, for myself in the writing I do. Um, so I need to do the best I can. I need to, to look to people uh, for answers. And then uh, I beg all of your forgiveness for the times that I do get it wrong. Thank you. Yeah. And not to speak for everyone, but you know, on behalf of people who are recovered addicts and, and neurodivergent and everything, just thank you for that level of effort. My pleasure. People find uh, with me that they're, they're always surprised that I can do atheism well. But the, you know, you guys have seen the whole joke. I am an atheist except for one God, right? <laughs> like, like one religion. There's a whole bunch of religions I'm atheistic about. I totally get it. Uh, there's just one that I do believe in, um, right? Uh, the, 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 we're not so far off, not so different, you and I. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Neil. Hey. Uh, given that chondra can replicate human organs, is it possible for a human and a chondra to have a child? And if so, would that child be purely human or some kind of combination? That's a yes, and it would be some kind of combination. Uh, are you in a costume? It looks uh, like yes. you are. Did I already give you a pin? I have not gotten a pin. Well, you may have a pin. Uh, looks like it might be a still Inquisitor costume. Uh, yeah. uh, the lights uh, are shining in my eyes, so it's kind of hard to see sometimes. Yes, I'm dressed as Marsh. OK, there you are. Well done. No, no, lights are fine. Lights are fine. But just uh, warning you, if I don't see your costume, that's why. Hi, I'm Phoebe. Hi. Um, Judging based purely on vibes, is the sibling the middle child? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, vibes wise. Maybe youngest, no, you know, sibling is, no, middle, let's Storm go middle. Stormfather feels oldest. Oh yeah, Stormfather's got, got oldest child vibes, for sure. <laughs> I'm an oldest child. Now, the secret of, or secret, the thing about this is, the research I've done say, this is all made up by us. Right? Like, if you look at actual research, but that research must be stupid because I know what the youngest <laughs> children are like, and my sister's totally one of them. But yeah. Hello. And you Hi. are in a costume, right? I am in Did a costume. Did you already give you a pin? I have not received All a pin. All right, you may have a pin Lovely. after. Cool. Um, hi, I'm Sarah. So, in Yumi and the Nightmare Painter, when Yumi's like flying out into the shroud, Hoyd makes a comment, and she, he says she didn't even have to burn tin. Yep. And I have a couple of questions about this. Okay. The first one I thought is, that might inspire some questions, so. Yeah, so my first one is, does that mean that the mist on Skadriel is made of something similar or even the same thing as the dispersed souls on Yumi's planet? Yes, yeah, something similar. Um, the idea is that being able to see through the investiture happens when you are kind of aligning to it in certain ways. Uh, it stops disrupting as much, in, um, and you gain some sort of extra sensory, sensory perception that it doesn't interfere with you as it might with someone else. And it's really nothing more than that. She's aligning to this, and, uh, and a mistborn is aligning to theirs. It doesn't mean she'd be able to see through the mist. Okay, so that kind of leads into my second question, mm -hmm. which was, does that mean that any highly invested individual could see through Scadrian mist, whether they be invested yeah. with breath or stormlight or... Yeah, not tin? necessarily. Okay. Um, this, this, yeah, not necessarily is what I would say. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there are ways you could, but not necessarily. Cool. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, go get your pen. And if you're wondering what the pins are, um, I, have a, um, I have a special pin they made for me this year that I, I like to give a present to people who, that come through my signing lines in costume. 
Uh, and so I always used to give away one of the nice Radiant pins, but there were other ways to get those. So the team made for me a pin this year that's, uh, that's Ash uh, from the Stormlight Archive that's the, the cosplayer pin. It's like the pin you get if you have been uh, a cosplayer and I have seen you in like a signing or a thing like this. Um, so you look like you have a miscloak, so you would count, <laughs> all right? Hello, so I'm uh, Ben Lewis. Um, I just wanted to ask about the Night Brigade. We were just told about that uh, you could use a Dawn Shard to reshape Shattered Shards, perhaps from something different. Well, I didn't actually confirm that. They just said maybe using okay. a Dawn Shard. They're looking, is there a way to do this? And I'm saying there is theoretically a way to do this. Would a Dawn Shard have to be involved? That is not uh, something that I'm canonizing. OK. so. The question is, is this the main reason that the Night Brigade is pursuing uh, Zalian in pursuit of the Dawn Shard? Um, the main reason that the Night Brigade is, uh, is chasing Zalian is that the Dawn Shards represent one of the most valuable things in the entire Cosmere. Why are they that valuable is because they are one of the, the things that, I mean, the Dawn Shards splint, uh, shattered Aiden Alcyon. That's what they were... That's what they did. And the vessels are all very rightly scared of them. That would be the second main reason. There are other reasons. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, I'm Kale. And my question is, what are the four Dawn Shards? Uh, Raffo, good question. Uh, they are the weapon used to, weapon used to shatter it in Alcyon. Um, what they actually are, I won't tell you yet, like what they're different, uh, but, um, but that's what they are in case you didn't know that much. But uh, if you already know that much, I'm not going to give you more. I'm sorry. Uh, but you can go get your raffle card. Hey, Brandon. I'm hey. Anthony. Can dragons only be born through biological means, or can someone become a dragon through another means? Um, so the way dragons exist in the Cosmere is that they are a, uh, a race, um, right? Uh, dragons have this thing where they actually, uh, in the Cosmere, dragons breed in their human form. They have both forms and give birth in their human form. And the dragon form um, has, uh, is, is separate, like, and so they, they raise families and have children as humans, and they consider both an equal form to them. Thank you. Is mm -hmm. Vasher a dragon? Vasher is not. Thank Keep you. Keep searching. <laughs> Howdy, Brandon. I'm Paul. Hi, Paul. Howdy. Uh, I was cu curious, what is the biggest editorial change you had to make to one of your stories from your arcanists who said, oh, you can't do this because of either something future you're going to write or for canon continuity? Oh, boy. Let's see. Um, I'm not sure if I can come up with the biggest. I can list a couple of them that I did change. Uh, they had a lot of influence over Sunlit Man and my wer weird little tiny planet, uh, my little prince planet that you're... Uh, that you're traveling around, and uh, getting me to do that accurately uh, to the point that at some points I'm like, yeah, I'm going to give a magical solution to that. And they're like, that's fine. Know that the physicists will complain. And they did. But then they got mad that there was, not mad, but then they're like, but there is a magical reason. Um, so that was one. Um, I've only had like the full Arcanist team on a couple of books so far, okay. right? Um, and so they've been involved in all the secret projects. Uh, they're working with me on Stormlight 5. This is just me finding the people who ask the questions that, uh, that make me go, huh, I hadn't considered that, and then putting them to work yeah. to be doing that uh, on my behalf. Um, and so um, really it was, um, it's, it's really most of what they do is not say no. They say, we would like an explanation. You should you know, make sure that this is included. And once in a while, it makes me pull back on an idea. But they're usually really small things um, that are going to cause issues for the future and things like that. I just met with them on Stormlight 5, for instance, and they gave me a few pointers on things that I'm like, they'd say, you probably should explain this, or you probably should not use this line, and things like that, because people are going to explore that, extrapolate that direction. I'm like, you are right. Uh, so uh, most of the, in most of the cases, they're like, what is this? And then I explain it, they're like, Great, you have an answer. We can move on, right? Uh, I'd say, you'd have to ask them, but I'd say like one out of 10 times I don't have an answer. 
And that, those one at a times are really handy for them to be asking those questions that I don't have answers to. Because I'm gonna have to go do this for all of you, and I better have the answers by then. So, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, Brandon. Hey. I'm also Brandon. Hey, good name. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question about the end of the Lost Metal, yes. where uh, one character lives and one character dies. Yes. Uh, that character kind of explicitly talked to Harmony and asked if there was a way to not die. Was Harmony lying? And if Harmony was not, I have a follow-up. Um, I would say that Harmony was not necessarily, like, um, was Harmony lying? Harmony's not lying by Harmony's perspective of things, right? Uh, in other words, is there a way to say, to make this not like, maybe there is like, you know, bringing together powers that like, is there, is, it, is there a path, theoretical path? Maybe, but not realistically, if that makes sense. Uh, I would say Harmony wasn't lying by the way Harmony perceives this. Okay, because it seems a little bit like we've seen gold compounding recover from some pretty significant things. Yes. You could maybe mm -hmm. blast out of the bubble with a dual aluminum push, maybe mm -hmm. use pewter to hold the door to protect yourself, even considering all of that. Uh, yeah, Harmony's looking, uh, saying all that and being like, none of this is gonna work in this situation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Afternoon, I'm Sam. Hey. hey, how you doing? You look like you're in costume. I am. Did you get a pen? I did, though okay. I would take a reality icon if you have one of those. Uh, ne never heard of reality icons before in my life. Um, oh, what's that? Oh, what's that? I, something fell on the floor. Oh, such a shame. Such a shame. Yeah. But I was going to ask, if you could realistically have a way, or assuming you had a way to siphon out a vessel from a shard, how much hemallergic metal would be required to contain that vessel? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Uh, an astronomically large amount. Hmm. Right. No, no, the vessel or contain the shard? The vessel. Contain the vessel? Yes. Oh, just if you were able to get, okay. How much? Oh, that, okay. Yeah, just uh, the little dude. Just the, just the little dude. Um, you know, not that much. Basically, like, a gemstone is able to hold um, a, um, like, a, a decent-sized gemstone can hold an unmade, and that's more investiture than, uh, than we're talking about, so, yeah. Hmm. Follow-up question, mm -hmm. Do, is metal around the same, or is hemallergic metal, can that hold around the same amount of a invested creature as a pure gemstone? No, gemstones can do more. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Mm-hmm. What is that on the floor? <laughs> hey, how you doing? Hi, I'm Spencer. Hey. Um, so does Shalon unknowingly shapeshift when she is holding Stormlight and an altar takes control? And if not, why do her altar's identities not affect her in the same way that other people's identities affect them? Uh, yeah, she does shift. Uh, and... Sometimes it's conscious, sometimes it's unconscious. But yes, it does happen. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Hi, Brandon. Hey, how you doing? Good. Let I'm... me check the time here so we oh. see how much time we got left. Um, so uh, we'll, so whoever's doing the questions, we'll end it. Let's do it 50 um, after you got that. OK, so we got, we got another 15 minutes, so don't worry. But we're kind of getting to the point where I'm going to go get a drink of water before, uh, before my next thing. Is it uh, my next thing, another signing? Yep, another signing. OK, great. <laughs> um, I'm Sarah for Joy Writing Bird. Um, okay. And my question is, throughout the Stormlight Archive, there's multiple times um, where we see characters, most often it's the Lopin, where he'll do, a, in response, a rude or obscene gesture. Yes. Brandon, will you please demonstrate for us what is... <laughs> a rude or obscene gesture in Roshar. Um, all right, it's probably, Lopen's going to be mimicking something you would do with two hands because one hand represents men and one re represents women on Roshar. All right? I'll just leave it at that. You really, it's gonna be something like that, okay? Thank 
you. Uh huh. <laughs> you people. <laughs> the stuff you make me do. I intentionally write rude gestures so I don't have to describe it. There's children in this room. Hi, my name is Ruth, and I was wondering, so originally you raffled information about whether or not Bavenna and Vasher got together and became a couple, but with the fact that the Nightblood story has kind of been put on hiatus, is there any way you're going to unraffo that information? Nope. <laughs> Can I ask a follow-up question Yes, you then? sure can, absolutely. Hold on, I had to write it down uh -huh. because that's the kind of person I am. So, suppression fabrils, they don't work above the fourth ideal for radiance, but they work on all fused. Why? Um, so I would imagine, so fused have in general a smaller amount of investiture than a radiant, or access to a smaller amount of vesture, than a radiant of those oaths. That's the dividing line that you can use to kind of uh, figure that out. Uh, go get a pen if you don't have one already. All right? I like that, uh, that missed cloak. Good job. Hi, how you doing? I'm great, how are you? I am well. <laughs> I have. Uh, this is the question that has probably come up the most often in the last two days. What color are the flight suits? Uh, flight suits? Yeah. So have I never described the color of the flight suits? No? We cannot find the information. I've always imagined a light blue. Light blue? Uh, light blue to the darker blue, but that's just one of my favorite colors. It shows up all the time. So maybe the team would convince me to do a different color. Uh, because, you know, I, I, I always end up with blues and reds. I don't do enough greens, and I see you've got a green on. So, um, in your version, you can canonize as, as, as green. Um, but I've, I've always imagined a bit of a blue. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So, mm-hmm. Hi, I'm Taylor. Hey. Uh, two very related questions. Uh, can a regular... Can a, yeah, can regular Threnodites from Threnody exchange heat like they do on Canticle? Uh, Raffo. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, then can, if a shade attacks a non-Threnodite, do they turn into a shade? Nope. Good Fair question. Enough. Yeah, excellent questions. And you know what? Looking at my mental picture, I think blue-gray is the actual right color. Blue-gray. <laughs> Blue gray. Hi, Brandon Jose. Hey, Jose. So a few years ago, you told us a little story about the future Skybreakers facing off against Skadrians for AVR. Yes. Were they doing that on behalf of their shards, or they were doing it for their own reasons? Raffo. <laughs> Excellent question. Yes, you can find that reading online. Um, a a possible sequel to Six of the Dusk that I worked on for a little while. Hey, Brennan. Hey. Um, if I were to visit Canticle in the sub-astral, yes. what would that look like? I think it'd be pretty violent um, and a uh, source of uh, constant shaking and tremors. Would it be dangerous? Yeah, I think it'd be dangerous. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So uh, my question is, if at any given point in the Cosmere, would Yolin be more technologically advanced than any other planet or society in the Cosmere? I think Yolin falls behind um, uh, because of certain things that they have access to. And uh, so um, uh, the point where it is the furthest along is during the early days when it's like Bronze Age and everyone else is like Stone Age. Uh, so right at the beginning, I think other planets have passed them by pretty much since then, consistently. Once the shards started meddling in things, planets started going faster, and the shards weren't meddling on Yolin. Uh, so Yolin has, uh, has had a more uh, natural, maybe even slowed technological progression, where some of the other planets have been super fast. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Go ahead and get a pin if you don't have one already. Thank you. Uh-huh. 
Hi, Brandon. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you? I'm well. Um, so I had a question about Hoyd. So if he was previously a Dawn Shard that prevented him from hurting himself or others, how could he use a hemallergic spike on himself? Uh, we don't know that he has. But would he be able to? Would he be able to? I think there is a way he could get around that if he needed to. Okay, thank you. Um, basically, he has to convince himself that this isn't actually hurting him, it's helping him. Right, similar um, to how he can do damage to cognitive shadows because they're not really being harmed. Yep, exactly. So. Okay, cool. And mm -hmm. I guess a follow-up then would be if Mraze took a uh, ATM spike and put it through Hoyd's chest and then into himself, would he gain different abilities because of Hoyd's altered spirit web? Yeah, he probably would. That's real, real terrifying to think about, that actually <laughs> happening, but I think he probably would. Cool, thank you. Mm-hmm. Hi, I'm Hi. Ellie. Hey. Um, and so someone was curious about this yesterday at a panel, but they wanted to know if a chondra could eat a dragon, either in human or just regular dragon form. Uh, they could eat one in human form. Uh, getting the whole thing eaten in dragon form would be a little like that scene in Elden Ring. You all, those who have played it know what I'm talking about. Uh, it, it'd be kind of hard to do. Mm-hmm. Howdy, Brandon. Hey. Are there any other dragons on Roshar other than Cultivation? Uh, there have been. But not currently. There might be some. There's not there. How about this? You shouldn't be looking for dragons among the characters of the Stormlight Archive. Oh, OK. okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. All right, it looks like we are done. Is that it? All right, so I get to take a 10 minute break. Um, hey, thank you guys. I, yeah. Um, those of you who might be here with spouses or family members or things might be like, why do they care about these things? Um, you know, fantasy is about immersion. I believe that is one of the main reasons we go to an epic fantasy. And the verisimilitude, the fact that it could be real, is a big part of why I enjoy reading them. And it means a lot to me. And I actually really appreciate you guys basically, like I said, stress testing my world for me and letting me get these answers. Um, and I enjoy this. Uh, it is very hard. It's probably the hardest thing that I, well, second hardest. I think my speech is the hardest, but second hardest thing I do at these conventions. But I do appreciate you. And thank you so much for reading. And thank you for your passion and care about the stories. Um, and I will see you again later tonight for my speech. <laughs>